Okay. Um, so I just need to check some things here. Yeah, okay, I think it's all right. <coughs> every time, <coughs> every time that I visited KKU, I am asked to give a talk and I always find it difficult to know what I should talk about. So um, i just get the points back up. Here we are. So I make up a talk, I make up a topic. I think of something and then I write a talk around that. Sometimes I actually don't know very much. So I try and find out and I make a talk and I put up some questions that I think are interesting. So I start with a disclaimer. This seminar has my own ideas. Some of them are probably wrong. So I've made a list of questions. We can debate them at the end. You'll see a few things um, coming up as questions. If we have time at the end, I would like the students who are listening to try to answer some of the questions and maybe to ask me a few questions. First thing I want to do is just define what I mean by parasites. I'm regarding parasites as multi-celled animals, such as nematodes and flatworms and acanthocephalans, and also protists, protozoans. There is such a thing as an emerging parasite, and there's a lot of interest in that. And Ajahn Wanchai sent me the definition that he is using for emerging and re-emerging parasites. If a disease is unknown in the location before, the disease is emerging. But if it was present already, but has been increasing, <coughs> then it's considered to be re-emerging. Here are a few questions. Are emerging parasitic diseases likely to persist and spread in the human population? Or are they rare diseases of which cases might appear from time to time without human to human transmission? Be interesting to see whether you have any feelings for that, for those questions. I've also put together a table. You probably know most of this already, but this might point out a few of the main differences between parasites and viruses. First of all, viruses are tiny, parasites are large, you know that. Direct multiplication inside the host, you know that. Whereas parasites, not always, but very often, have a life cycle stage outside the host. Often, a viral infection is of short duration. That is common, things like coronavirus, for example, generally is short duration. A number of viruses like HIV, hepatitis, herpes, some of the other viruses cause long lasting infections, but many are short. Parasites cause relatively long lasting infections. <coughs> Parasites cause generally incomplete host immunity and vaccines are ineffective generally against parasites. Whereas for viruses, the host often develops sterilizing immunity. So there are a number of other things down here. Two more points that I'll point out, which I think are important. First of all, for viruses, the mutation rate is extremely high. For parasites, <coughs> the mutation rate we could call it normal. Nothing special about it, it's pretty much the same as for people. So that's one thing to remember. Another thing to remember, in my opinion, is that most parasites that will ever infect humans now and into the future have probably not been discovered yet. Sorry, most viruses that will ever infect humans have not been discovered yet. Whereas most parasites that will ever infect humans have already been reported from some part of the world. I'll go further with some of that. First of all, to pick up on the point about parasite mutation. The mutation rate, sorry, I'm getting myself confused sometimes. Virus mutation. Please somebody, Throw something at the camera if I say parasite when I mean virus. 
viruses mutate so quickly that you can follow their epidemiological history even in weeks and months, whereas for parasites, it may be hundreds of years. So this is simply a phylogenetic tree of one lineage of dengue virus in Central America. And you can see at this point here, this was 1997, 1999, 2001, and so on. The mutations that accumulate along each of these branches happen so fast that from one month to the next, or from one year to the next, you can see the differences and put a time scale on the evolution and change in a virus. You can do the same with SARS-CoV-2, but most of the phylogenetic trees of that are so complex that I couldn't show them on a slide. How many different kinds of viruses are there in the world? Well, the answer is a lot. According to this website, which seems to be fairly authoritative and has a lot of information on virus taxonomy, there are, there are six and a half thousand described species. But one estimate by Anthony et al. here says that maybe mammals alone have around 320,000 different virus species. By the year 2012, 219 species of viruses were known from humans. By 218, this has increased to 263 viruses. <clears throat> but in this study, and I've given a link to it here, in this study, there was an estimate of a global total of 1.67 million virus species in birds and mammals, and an astonishing total of about 827,000 viruses, which could possibly switch into people. So viral diversity is something which we need to be very concerned about in the future. And these are various categories of viruses in humans. This is a list of all the various virus genera that are known from humans. We don't need to worry about seeing that more. Well, the next question then should be, how many species of parasites are there? And the answer is a lot. For things like trematodes, at least 25,000, cestodes, 6,000 or more, parasitic nematodes, these are the most difficult to estimate. There are at least 20,000 known species, many of them infecting plants, not animals. But there are probably many, many more than that. Insects, parasitic insects, certainly about a million different species, but most of these are parasites of other insects and therefore not so interesting for us. And the protozoan or protist parasites, such as malaria, we have no idea how many there are, uncountable numbers. There may be as many as 300,000 different helmets that can parasitize vertebrates, but nobody knows. Molecular studies, which have come into use, particularly in about the last 20 years, have found a larger number of parasites than we previously suspected. And we increasingly know that morphology alone is not sufficient to recognize species. And this is just one example of a molecular study finding more parasites than expected. Some people collected snails in East Africa and they sequenced DNA from Sicarii. They found 17 different kinds of echinostone trematodes. Of all of these, only one single clade could be identified as a known species. All the other ones were unknown. So there is a great unknown diversity of parasites which we're only now beginning to uncover using molecular methods. Well, how many parasites have been recorded from humans? <clears throat> Unfortunately, I've never been able to get a copy of this book, 
but Ashford and crew listed around about 305 species of helminth parasites known from humans. A more recent study by Wells et al, 2018, this is quite an important paper, and I'll mention it again later on, so you may be interested in having a look at it. They, partly reflecting the increased use of molecular methods, they list 397 helminth species. <clears throat> Unfortunately, they didn't provide an actual list of the species names. They just said that's the number. It's unfortunate that they haven't provided a list because that would be rather useful. Well, we're talking at the moment about human parasites. So let's have a little bit of a think about human ancestry and how the parasites in humans might have arisen. Primates, and humans are among the primates, arose quite a long time ago in the tertiary, around about 65 million years ago, the earliest primates were around, shortly after the dinosaurs mostly disappeared. Modern humans split from chimpanzees, well, that is not modern humans, humans, the human lineage split from chimpanzees around 7 million years ago. Sometimes people say 8, sometimes 10, but around about that. So our question is, by looking at parasites which are present in gorillas, chimpanzees, and modern humans, can we estimate which parasites might have been present in the earliest human lineage 7 million years ago, about that point? And when we look at them, these are the only ones we come up with, rather a small number, and certainly much less than the um, 395 which are currently in humans. So the earliest human lineage appeared about 7 million years ago. Humans had a lot of evolution in Africa, left Africa around about 100,000, maybe a little more than that, years ago. This is a partial timeline of human evolution over the last 2 million years. So the human timeline goes back beyond 2 million years to about 7 million years ago. But all we need to do is look here. We can see that in Africa, this is Africa here, various human lineages appeared. Humans like Neanderthals and Homo erectus moved to other parts of the world, but became replaced by modern humans, Homo sapiens, starting about 100,000 years ago. Well, between 100,000 years ago and 7 million years ago, humans acquired a number of other parasites. For example, tapeworms in the genus Tinea. This is a phylogenetic tree based on morphology, showing the likely origins of T. solium and T. saginata. T. solium is probably came about by a host switch from a tapeworm, which was an old tapeworm in hyenas. This must have happened in Africa Humans somehow became infected with a tapeworm which switched from hyenas. And Tinea saginata and later Tinea asiatica derived from a tapeworm which was in lions. So these host switches probably happened in Africa before modern humans moved to the rest of the world. A slightly later paper, this one here, used molecular methods and largely supported this theory, except that they said Tinea saginata was probably originally a parasite of bears, ursids, bears, and not lions. But we don't know the answer to that yet. Well, humans have acquired a lot of different kinds of helmets since leaving Africa. 100,000 years ago. These all have zoonotic origins. I'll make the point that many are rare in humans. And I'm going to talk a bit about host specificity and host switching. These are topics that I talked about in CanCan, I think, two years ago. But I'm going to mention them again. Most parasites 
are rather host specific. That is, they infect only one species of host or a few closely related species. There are exceptions. Aceola hepatica, for example, can infect a wide range of mammals as an adult. So can Schistosoma japonicum, and some echinostome trematodes can infect mammals and birds. The same species can occur in both groups. But for the most part, parasites only live in one kind of host or a small number of hosts. So in this graph of 216 trematode species, almost all, nearly 100%, have only a single host. And I'm not sure if this is number of species. Yes, it is. 100 species have only a single host. And about 45 species can occur in two hosts. The same for cestodes. The same for lice. Same story again. Most species of lice can only occur on a single host, or they occur on a small number of host species. When they occur on more than one host or in more than one host, those hosts are usually closely related. Well, why might parasites be host specific? Well, most parasites have shared a long evolutionary history with their hosts. As a result, they've become adapted to life in or perhaps on a particular host. So maybe they have evolved ways to evade the immune system of only that host, and they will have trouble if they go into other hosts. Maybe they have evolved ways to recognize the correct host. Maybe they've evolved life cycle adaptations that help gain access to the next host. For example, the parasite might put its infective stages into food items eaten by the final host. Or they may target intermediate hosts that occur in the same environment. And parasites may even have lost the capacity to synthesize certain molecules and can only obtain these from a particular host. I believe one example of that is the rabbit flea, which is only capable of coming into reproductive condition when it's on a female rabbit who is herself breeding. So all of these things, all of these reasons why parasites might be host specific are also reasons why a parasite might find it difficult to jump into another host. And yet most of the parasites, most of the helmets of humans have done exactly that. They've jumped from some other animal into humans in the last maybe 100,000 years. And as I said, host specificity often has an evolutionary component. So you may get a phylogenetic tree of parasites as such we have here on the right, and a phylogenetic tree of hosts. And the evolution of the parasites will follow that of the hosts. Here there is strict co-speciation if we were to get parasites switching hosts, it's most likely they would switch into the most closely related host species. So this one, number four, would switch into host C, for example, more easily than it would switch into host A. So the original parasites of humans that I showed you on an earlier slide mostly co-evolved with the great apes, chimpanzees, gorillas, and humans. And since then, humans have gained parasites by host switching. Host switching is a very powerful force in the, in the evolution of parasites. Host switching as those who've attended Ajahn Wanchai's lectures will know, usually comes about as a consequence of ecological factors. For example, diet, because many helminths gain access to their hosts via the food. If you have a phylogeny of this sort, in which the phylogenetic tree of parasites 
does not exactly match that of the hosts, then we would suspect host switching was taking place. And I'll show you some examples later of such phylogenetic trees. In this case, parasite small b has jumped into a distantly related host d. And here is a picture of a man eating something. I'm still trying to work out what it is. I think he's eating a frog. Uncooked. Mm. In an earlier slide, I mentioned the paper by Wells et al. in 2018. They did a study on the factors which are associated with the switching of parasites from wildlife into humans. So those that are interested in this topic should certainly look at that paper. This chart here shows the probability that wildlife species share helminth parasite species with humans or selective domestic, selective domestic species. So they've done the analysis for humans, but also for other animals that share the same habitats as humans very much. Dog, cat, cow, pig, and then verminous animals. Things like black rats, brown, brown rats. All of these could potentially be sources of parasites that could jump from wildlife into these and then from these into humans. And I'll say a little more about that. But this chart has nematodes, cestodes, and trematodes. Here, it has the factor, such as zoogeographical region, host phylogeny, longevity, diet, temperature, things of that sort. And down here, along the x-axis, the relative influence or relative importance. What strikes you immediately is that diet has the strongest influence on whether a parasite is likely to jump from wildlife into humans or into these domestic animals. Wild animals that have a diet similar to those of humans are likely, are much more likely to share their parasites. A secondary feature is host phylogeny. That's especially important for nematodes, but by far the most important predictor of whether parasites can jump from one host to another is if they share parasite, if they share the same kind of diet. I put this table in as well. It's not really part of the talk, but it's quite interesting because this is their supplementary table of recorded helminth species from humans and a few other animals. The number in parentheses is the number shared with wildlife species. So of 163 nematodes known from humans, recorded from humans, many of them only very rarely, 80 species are also known from wildlife. And the same values are here for cow, pig, nematodes, cestodes, etc. I've talked about this example of a foodborne parasite. So if humans have mostly become infected by wildlife parasites as a consequence of a similar diet to those of the normal host, the wildlife host, here is an example. This example has quite a complicated history. I think it's a mistake to assume that the evolutionary history of infections of humans is simple. I think it's often very complicated. Paragonimus, Paragonimus westermani, for example, the metasicarii are in freshwater crabs. Freshwater crabs are eaten by people. They're also eaten by the normal wildlife hosts of Paragonimus lung fluke species. For example, leopards, tigers, wildcats, ferrets, weasels, uh, probably raccoon dogs, wild dogs, rats, all sorts of things will eat freshwater crabs. Paragonimus westermani itself is regarded quite often as a single species. However, 
we know from molecular studies that there is a huge amount of variation with the geographical component. This is a phylogenetic tree based on mitochondrial sequence data. Of Paragonimus westermani from Northeast India, Sri Lanka, Thailand, Malaysia, the Philippines, Taiwan, mainland China, Korea, Japan, and the far north of China. Interestingly, human infections with this parasite are very common, or used to be very common. Public health measures have largely eradicated them. In the far northeast of the range, Japan, Korea, northeast China, and are still quite common in the Philippines. Nowhere else in the range of this species can humans become infected. Humans still eat freshwater crabs elsewhere in the range, and especially here and here, humans become infected with other kinds of paragonimus, especially paragonimus heterotremus. So what's going on? Well, here is the one evolutionary scenario for this group of trematodes. There may be other evolutionary explanations, but this is certainly one. Probably Paragonimus westermani initially appeared in South Asia, India, Sri Lanka, this region, and it used freshwater tiarid snails. This would have been probably millions of years ago. Humans did not yet exist, and the final hosts would have been carnivorous mammals such as wildcats, leopards, tigers, and a range of mustelids, mongoose, many animals of that sort. Some millions of years ago, snails of a different family, Pleuroceridae, migrated from North America into Northeast Asia. We don't know exactly when, but it was a long time ago. Some Paragonimus westermani also managed to spread into Northeast Asia. How did they do that? Well, remember that the final hosts of these parasites are often very large, very mobile carnivores, such as tigers and leopards. And those carnivores are spread all through these regions, or used to be. So it's not too hard to imagine that the hosts moved around a lot and took the parasites with them. Humans arrived maybe 60,000 years ago, maybe 100,000 years ago in East Asia. There were another kind of human probably here earlier, Homo erectus. We know nothing about the parasites of Homo erectus, but modern humans replaced them 60 to 100,000 years ago and acquired Paragonimus. This only happened in Northeast Asia and the Philippines. What's interesting is that as humans spread through this area, the original hosts were displaced. So you simply don't find lions and leopards in these parts of Asia any longer. And even populations of some of the smaller carnivores are now very much reduced. So now, or until recently, Humans were the principal host species for Paragonimus westermani. In most countries, especially, I'll point out Korea, and hello to the people from Korea, and Japan, Paragonimus westermani has been almost eliminated, and it's gone back to being a very low-level infection, cycling through a small number of wild animals. So this is an example the way in which parasites can evolve and change, the way in which humans can become infected through time. We can imagine that host switching from one host species into another, such as humans, could go through these four steps. I can imagine additional steps as well. Probably all the parasites ever recorded from humans would fit into one of these boxes. The first box, occasional infection of humans, but no transmission. So these would be rare parasites 
which we might regard as emerging or dead-end parasites. The next box, occasional infection of humans. Transmission possible, but the pathogen or parasite mainly cycles in other kinds of hosts. The third box, humans and other hosts all transmit the pathogen. So in the first three boxes here, we're concerned with um, parasites that are still circulating in the environment. So these are effectively zoonotic. And the final stage is the stage in which humans become the principal or the only host. So I imagine these are the four stages that you could imagine that human parasites will fit into. So I'm going to ask you a question. In which of these categories would you place Paragonimus westermani? Can someone give me an answer? I know it's difficult because of the microphone situation. So would you place, okay, I'll call for people, I'll call for a, a vote. Could the people in the meeting room put up their hands if they agree that Paragonimus westermani should belong in this box? Nobody. How about this box? How about this box? How about this box? <laughs> I'm sorry, but I can, I, thank you. We have one person. Yes, probably Paragonimus westermani in Northeast Asia should belong to this box. And Paragonimus heterotremus, Paragonimus heterotremus, probably belongs in this box or in this box, because Paragonimus heterotremus is still zoonotic in places like Thailand and goes through natural mammal hosts as well as humans. So I think that parasites that fall in these two boxes and are still clearly zoonotic, circulating through wildlife reservoirs, should be classed as emerging diseases or possibly as rare diseases. And we won't bother about the next questions. Well, I'm going to have a drink of tea. And everybody should now do that with their shoulders and take a deep breath. And then I'll move on. I've already said that of humans, there's a lot of different species. We have 395 helminth species recorded from humans. Almost all of these have become parasites of humans relatively recently in history. So they all have a zoonotic origin, and we should be able to trace their origins back to wildlife. Many of these species are still not fully human parasites. They are rare or emerging human parasites, which may be quite uncommon and which may not even be able to complete their life cycle in humans. And here we can think about the kinds of problems that a parasite might face if it's going to colonize a different host, if it's going to go into humans instead of into cats or leopards or wild boars. You could think about these problems, these barriers that it has to overcome, like a series of filters. The first filter is geographical. The parasite has to be in the same place as the humans. You can't infect a human in America if you're a parasite in Thailand. You have to be in the same place. Ideally, also, the behavior of humans should increase the likelihood of contact between the humans and the parasite. The infective stage of the parasite should recognize humans as possible hosts. It's no good if the parasite, if you eat the parasite and it doesn't know you're a possible host. The parasite has to be able to get onto you or into you. 
and once inside it has to find the right place. Then it must evade the host immune system and reproduce and so on. So these are pretty serious barriers, pretty serious problems that the poor old parasite has to face. I think you should feel sorry for parasites. They have a difficult life. But we can go through a few of these in turn. The parasite should be in the same place as humans and human behavior should, be, should increase the likelihood of contact. Well, many emerging and rare parasitic infections are in people who spend time in natural habitats. They may be exposed to insect bites. They may be cutting down trees and things fall on them. They may be clearing land for farms. They may be barefoot, so parasite larvae can get into their feet. Or they may have eaten uncooked and interesting kinds of foods. I've always liked this photograph. This photograph was taken by a colleague of mine in Papua New Guinea. There, local people hunt possums, mammals that live in trees. Once they've killed the possum, they'll eat that, but they also open up the intestine of the possum and remove the large tapeworms that live in the intestine of the possum. And then they eat the tapeworms, uncooked. It's not something I would care to do, but it's a delicacy in some parts of Papua New Guinea. The infective stage of the parasite must, must recognize humans as possible hosts and be able to get into humans. How do they do that? Actually, we don't really know. It's probably different for every parasite species. For those contemplating research in parasitology, there are possibly some interesting investigations that you could do, trying to work out how a cicaria recognizes a snail, for example or how a Ramian and Mericidium recognizes a snail, or how a Cicaria recognizes the right kind of fish to attach to. Some of that kind of work has already been done, but really there's not very much known about it. Um, so, for example, Opistorchus viverini, Metasicaria like this, I mean fish. Any infected fish has a chance of being eaten by humans, yes, but also by many other species. Rats, birds, snakes, predatory fish, all sorts of things. But for reasons that we really do not understand, the Metasicari only mature in a few different mammal species, especially humans, dogs, cats, maybe rats. So I think there is some research in the future to be done on trying to understand why they mature only in certain things or why Cicaria only attached to certain fish. We know the how of it. We know that they do, but we don't know the why. We don't know the mechanisms. The parasite must be able to find a suitable niche in the host. And again, in most cases, we have no idea how it is they do that. Here on the left is a slide that I think a photograph I've shown before in the past. This is the mouth of a sea cow, a dugong, and you can see very faintly some small holes in the lip. It's got a hairy lip, just like me. See my hairy lip? So, under there, in the dugong, there's a little pore, and inside that pore, deep down in the tissues, there is a trematode, about two centimeters long. It lays eggs in there, and the eggs come out through that pore, into the seawater. We have no idea how that trematode gets there. It's a complete mystery. Here we have metasicaria of something called the plostomum, living in the lens of a fish eye. You should have these in Thailand, I don't know. The lens of the fish eye is necessary for the fish to see. When it's filled with metasicaria, the fish goes blind. And then the birds that are the final host can catch the fish easily and become infected. But how the metasicaria make their way to the lens of the eye is a mystery. We don't know. And of course, if a parasite gets into a host, but it's the wrong host, 
it can cause immense damage if it gets lost. Examples, Angiostrongylus cantonensis, which is a very, very serious problem if it gets into a human. Paragonimus miyazakii, which does not mature in humans, or not easily. Instead, it wanders in the tissues. And here is an example from a dog of an inguinal subcutaneous mass containing adult worms and eggs, Paragonimus miyazakii. So the parasites, if they don't get into the right host, may go wandering and cause problems. Sometimes the structures used to hold the parasite in place won't work if the parasite is in the wrong host. Some species of lice, here's what a head louse uses to hold on to the host. For some species of lice, the claw is so specific that they can't shift to another host because they're adapted only for gripping the hair of one kind. And if you like tapeworms, do any of you like tapeworms? If you like tapeworms, then the best place to look is inside sharks. They have the most amazing tapeworms. And the scolex of a shark tapeworm is usually designed to hold on to just one part of a shark intestine and won't work if you put it into another host. There's more. Parasite must be able to evade the host immune system. But I'm sure that students at KKU have learned a lot about this. I'm not going to go into it. And you also know a lot about this. Parasite must be able to release its next life cycle stage into the environment as eggs or in vectors, whatever it is. So there is a great range of challenges faced by any parasite if it is to find, enter, and establish in a new host species. So parasites can switch hosts. They do switch hosts. We know that it happens, but it doesn't happen very easily. I'll just briefly mention a couple of emerging or rare parasites that are known in Thailand that have been able to get through at least some of these filters that I've been talking about. One of these is vector, vectorborne. It's Plasmodium nolzai, a malaria parasite of monkeys. There have been a lot of human cases reported from Malaysia and rather fewer cases from other parts of the region, including the Philippines. And it's mostly been noticed since people started using molecular diagnostic methods, because it's very difficult to distinguish this one morphologically from some of the other Plasmodium species. But it seems that deforestation and development of farms and towns have been forcing monkeys to forage closer to human settlements, and they get bitten by, human people get bitten by infected mosquitoes, transmission occurs, and occasionally the parasite can establish in humans. This is one example of a rare or emerging parasite in Southeast Asia. Here is that diagram that I put up earlier, and I want to know where P. nolzai belongs in this scheme. Now, actually, I'm not sure that we know enough about this parasite to be sure. We don't know, I think, whether it's possible for, for Plasmodium nolzai to be transmitted from humans back to monkeys or from humans to other humans. I don't think this is known yet. So possibly Plasmodium nolzii belongs in here, or possibly it belongs in here. Occasional infection of humans, but the pathogen mainly cycles in other hosts. So it's certainly in this general area. And the second emerging parasite that I've chosen for Southeast Asia, for Thailand, is Trichinella papuae. This was originally found in pigs in Papua New Guinea and seems to be quite an old parasite of pigs in New Guinea. The definitive host in New Guinea is the saltwater crocodile. For those that don't know about the saltwater crocodile, it's probably the largest predator on the planet, apart from great white sharks. 
can reach eight, even nine meters in length. It can swallow something the size of a small car when it's that big. In Thailand, there are no or few saltwater crocodiles, and yet larvae of Trichinella papuae have been found in wild boar, and also larvae have been found in people after eating boar meat. Probably the definitive hosts in Thailand are large pythons or other reptiles, not crocodiles. Experimentally, pythons and large monitor lizards can become infected with Trichinella papuae. Again, we have this diagram. Where does Trichinella papuae belong in this scheme? Well, I think it belongs here. Occasional human infection, no transmission. There's no transmission simply because humans are not eaten by crocodiles in Thailand, at least not that I know. If anyone can tell me to the contrary, I would be interested. Nor, I think, are humans eaten by large pythons in Thailand. So there's no avenue for this parasite to complete its life cycle through humans. So this is a rare disease occasionally found in humans with no transmission. Nevertheless, Trichinella papuae remains one of the 395 helminths known from humans. Okay, time for another sip of tea. Well, viruses have to go through the same kinds of filters if they are to jump from one species to another. The filters are slightly different and various filters differ in their importance, but some of them are the same. For example, human behavior. Human behavior that can increase the likelihood of contact for viruses is very important. Many viruses are, are spread, as is coronavirus, by aerosol transmission or by contaminated surfaces. So the viruses might be present on surfaces. And humans touch a lot of things, and humans breathe each other's aerosols, or the aerosols of animals in markets or in zoos or in farms. So it's quite easy, possibly, for viruses to transmit because of this human behavior. Humans tend to form dense crowds that enhances transmission. And here is an example of a recent dense crowd of humans. I hope many of these people catch COVID-19. They deserve it. Another bit of human behavior is that humans often destroy natural habitats putting stress on animals living there. It's been shown, it's an interesting thing, it's been shown that if you stress a population of animals, if you remove habitat, if you harass them, if you destroy their food source, then the transmission of viruses by those animals increases greatly. This is often referred to as viral shedding. And it leads to spillover or host switching into other host species. Virologists often use this term, spillover, rather than host switching. Stress due to human activities, especially if you put animals in a cage and take them to a market, will mean that those animals greatly increase their viral shedding. And it's a great avenue then for transmission to other species. And that's summarized in this diagram from a paper that was published before COVID-19 appeared. And it includes, as the stresses, confinement in cages and habitat destruction. So these bats here, sitting in a cage waiting to be eaten, are probably all busy shedding viruses that the humans around them in the market might acquire. Something else which is very important for viruses is the cell surface in the host. Viruses need a receptor that they can attach to. For parasites, 
The cell surface is much less important. In fact, it's often very unimportant, except for things like Leishmania and Plasmodium, <coughs> Babesia, stuff like that. But for most viruses, they need some kind of receptor on the host cell that they can bind to and induce endocytosis. They then incorporate themselves into the host genome, assemble new viruses and release them. This whole process in many viruses is what I call hit and run. The infection goes in very fast. The development and production of new viruses is very fast. And they have produced many, many millions of copies to go on to the next host before the host immune system can catch up. Then the host immune system kicks in and kills the remaining viruses. But it's too late. The host is too slow. These are the hit and run viruses. That's what most viruses do. Parasites can't do that. Parasites have to develop a way of avoiding, evading, suppressing the host immune system. Most, but not all viruses are hit and run. Some viruses, of course, do suppress the host immune system. For example, HIV lives in cells of the host immune system. But that's another story. And that extraordinarily high mutation rate of viruses means that it's very easy for viruses to try out new mutations that may work better. For example, I've hardly mentioned coronavirus at all. SARS-CoV-2 has a... Okay, there was somebody asking a question. Okay. SARS-CoV-2 has a receptor binding domain and a receptor binding motif on its surface. This is a three-dimensional structure showing the amino acids in it. And the ACE2 receptor up here is on the surface of human cells. Mutations in this receptor can increase or reduce its ability to bind to the human receptor. This binding domain is subject to mutation. This paper, Star et al. 2020, was interesting because they artificially created all the possible mutations that could occur in this region and found that many of them, in fact, increased the ability of the receptor binding domain, receptor binding motif, to bind to the human cell receptor. And these viruses are constantly trying out new mutations, constantly finding ones that work better. It makes them very quick to mutate into forms that are maybe more transmissible and potentially more pathogenic. So this is the big thing that viruses have that are different from parasites. They mutate so fast. This, just how much do viruses switch from one species of host to another? This is similar to the kinds of trees that I've shown before. On the, on the left, we have a host phylogeny. On the right, we have virus phylogeny. This family of viruses includes the hepatitis B virus. These are DNA viruses. I think you'd agree that there is some host switching shown there, but not a lot. Well, we would expect viruses to be able to host switch a lot. What about other kinds of viruses? Oh, these are Raptoviridae. These are RNA viruses that include rabies. Look at this. Host switches everywhere. The Raptoviridae are able to host switch easily between different kinds of mammals, which is a bit of a concern for us. The rabies group of viruses is a very large group and occurs in many different kinds of mammals. And of course, I do have to include the coronaviruses again. Here they are. Coronaviruses are also, especially those of mammals, also very capable of jumping between different hosts. So viruses have switched frequently. 
They can do this in a time scale of days, weeks, and months, whereas parasites will host switch in a time scale of centuries or thousands of years. So I'm on to the last two or three slides now. And I want to make a few predictions. What of the future for parasites? Well, here's a nice picture. It shows a forest with a city in the background. In the forest, there will be a complex ecosystem with many species. Mammals, birds, reptiles, insects, trees, all sorts of things. In the city, there's a greatly simplified ecosystem. There are people, lots and lots of people. There are dogs and cats. There are rats. There are some kinds of birds. There may be some kinds of bats, but nothing like the complex ecosystem which occurs here. So for parasites, increased urban development, increased agricultural development will reduce the richness of ecosystems. The number of new and emerging parasitic diseases is going to be small, in my opinion. I think we've already seen most of the emerging diseases that we're ever going to see. Eventually, but not for many, many years, this is going to take a long time. Most human societies will suffer from a relatively small but important <coughs> suite of parasitic diseases. What are these going to be? Well, they may be ones that have come from or go through, oh, pardon me, domestic animals, agricultural animals, vermin like rats, mice. And what about urban breeding insects? Maybe some Anopheles mosquitoes can breed in cities and transmit malaria. So the parasites we're likely to see in the future, in my opinion, are going to be things like pinworm, maybe hookworm, maybe strongyloides, maybe malaria in the right places, um, a few others as well. Probably things like intestinal protozoan parasites, things which are encouraged by dense human populations. But maybe some of the students who are listening can come up with some more ideas. And what about viruses? Same sort of thing applies. The same processes will lead to an increase in viral spillover. Clearing of land for houses, clearing of land for farms is going to lead to an increase in viral spillover, I think for many years. In fact, some recent publications have suggested that the pandemics are increasing in frequency, and I think they will do so in the future. Viral pandemics will occur in the future. Eventually, when natural places and wild animals have almost disappeared, spillover from natural populations will reduce. But a question is, do you think the world will ever reach that state? Do you think that we will ever get to a point where there actually are no wild animals and no wild places? In some parts of the world, we are actually rather close to that. Some of the highly industrialized parts of the world. But even if spillover stops, interesting, paras interesting viruses which are present in, in humans and in human associated animals will appear from time to time and spread through the population. Viruses can mutate so quickly that even common viruses that we already know may come up with completely new forms that cause new pandemics. <clears throat> and of course, we have an excellent example of that in influenza. Some influenza pandemics have started from bird flu, but some are from human populations. And this is going to happen again in the future. Mutations of existing viruses are going to keep on appearing in populations and keep on causing trouble. Existing parasites, existing helminths on the other hand, are not going to do that. They will not mutate and become something different. 
So, as I said, this talk has been my own ideas. The conclusions are not particularly strong. They've simply been a reflection on parasites and on viruses and on the status of humans in all of this. And I will encourage questions, but before I do, this last image here, this comes from Brazil. These are NASA satellite photographs of a region of rainforest in southern Brazil. I think it's southern Brazil, Rondonia. Taken in 1986, 1996, 2006. You can see in the north, largely untouched forest, 20 years later, the forest is almost completely clear. This is the kind of activity which is going to lead to greatly increased viral spillover into humans and to some increase into new parasites switching hosts as well. But by the time we have reached almost complete elimination of the natural habitat, such as down at the bottom here, then we should expect to see reduction in spillover and fewer rare parasites. There's no natural habitat left for zoonotic infection to come from. Okay, that's it. Thank you, everybody. I would like to call for questions if we have time. Ajahn Samchai, do we have time for any questions? David, um, may I have a first question? Okay. Um, I'm just, you know, just not, um, in, uh, thank you for your talk, first of all. And I'm just open my mind about the, in the, the term called host switching. Because in my knowledge, I think parasitic infection is, is almost is host specific city is, 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 is the major. So my question is how easy to get host switching? For example, if I eat so many raw pork that containing uh, animal tikkenella often, is that easy to get host switching all the time or they need some other factor to promote host switching in that case? Um. I think that's rather complicated to answer. I don't think we know enough. Um, some circumstances could be that you have immune compromised status. So that could mean that your body is not really able to fight the infection off. That's been found, for example, sometimes AIDS patients who are immunocompromised have very strange parasitic infections. Quite often when you read the literature on unusual parasite infections, it's in people who have HIV and they become infected because their immune system isn't capable of fighting off these strange parasites. It the thing that I think happens, I'm not going to use a human example, I'm going to use a snail example. One thing that I think happens is that some trematodes are able to infect a new snail species, but not very well. But because they don't infect it very well, the few individuals of the trematode that can go through that snail species are selected by evolution to be able to go better back into that snail. So quite quickly, you have by selection the evolution of a population of trematodes that can now use a new snail. I think that also probably happens with humans. If you swallow 5 million infective larvae of Haemonchus contortus, and I choose that one deliberately, that's an interesting stomach worm of sheep and goats. Ajahn Opal is nodding her head. 4,999% well, 4,999 of those will probably die. One might be able to persist. One or two might persist and perhaps pass out a few eggs. The reason they can persist is because they are genetically predisposed to be able to live in a human. They have just the right kind of genetic makeup 
to make it possible. That means that there's a possibility that their offspring can be transmitted back into humans. Does that help to answer the question? Yeah. <laughs> David, use as example for tequila may be not suitable because tequila is low specificity for horse. Yeah, man, uh, yes, that's true. 13 isolates of tequila species can infect uh, from early with vertebrate, eh? many turtle, uh, uh, from turtle until Homo sapien. Eh? Maybe uh, I agree with Professor David. It's a use example for climate but for tikla, maybe not. Tikla is a low specificity for hot. Like tikla papo, it can infect from crocodile until human. In uh, if you transfer from crocodile to human, it can infect. It like low specificity. Maybe change to a climate or another thing, not tikla. I, I believe. So there are still okay. there are still um, the, uh, like a controversial in between horse specific city and horse switching. That maybe person um, that we uh, answer <laughs> compare horse specific and horse switching is different or not? <laughs> they are different. A parasite is typically host specific, which means that it's difficult for it to switch to another one. Most parasites will only live in one or a few different species, but they can host switch and it has happened. And that's the way in which almost all the parasites of humans have come into humans through host switching. Host switching is, as I've already said in this talk, is quite difficult for parasites. And do you remember that, um, uh, let's see, I'll go back to the slideshow if I can, and shh, can you see that? Is that visible to you? Not yet, not yet. Okay, wait a moment. Wait a moment. Oh, come on, come on, come on. I need to do this screen sharing. There it is. That one. Can you see that? Yes, coming. This diagram, I don't need to put it on full screen. I think probably humans moving to a new place or eating a new food, very occasionally, the parasite of some other animal would be able to, to establish long enough in humans to cause an infection. Probably these are the rare parasites that we see now, the emerging parasites that we see now. Rano Ajahn Wanchai has talked about in his lectures. And I suspect this happens quite a lot. And maybe after a few thousand years, one or two of the species of parasite are able to transmit from humans or from humans, from one human to another or from humans back to wildlife. Again, probably rather uncommon but it still happens. Now, humans start increasing in numbers and the original hosts start decreasing in numbers, which means that it becomes highly selected. Evolution will now start selecting individuals of this parasite that can infect humans. This parasite will come, become more adapted to humans. This process will take quite a long time. And eventually, perhaps, the parasite will become the principal or the only host of that parasite. Humans will be the only host. So I think there is a kind of series of stages. This is probably the most frequent. Probably most of the parasites have humans just occasionally turn up, but they don't host switch. They just form an infection which is transient, which is not transmitted. Quite a lot more of them form an infection in humans, which may pop to other humans or back to wildlife. And a few of them eventually become, humans become the principal or the only host. 
Does that answer your question? Yes, I got the answer now. Thank you, David. David, okay. I think that uh, yes. in the first book, no transmission, it needs meaning. What is the meaning? Is the no transmission from human to human or human to another host? <laughs> try try again. I can't hear I can't hear you very well. No transmission is meaning. No transmission is meaning. No transmit from human to human or from human to another host. Uh, no, I might have heard the question, I'm not sure. Um, transmission, some kinds, it's possible. We were talking about um, Plasmodium nolzai. We know that that occasionally is transmitted to humans, but we don't know whether it can be transmitted further from a one human to another or from a human back to a monkey. We, I don't think we know that. Ajahn Wenchai, do you know the answer to that question? Is Ajahn Wenchai still there? Uh, hello, please confirm your question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and my question is, we know that Plasmodium nolzai is occasionally transmitted to humans. Do we know if it's possible of being transmitted from humans back to monkeys or from humans to other humans. Uh, to Do you know? Human or to another horse? Maybe difficult to answer. <laughs> yes, I, this, this is the kind of thing we can do research on and try to find out. Um, but yes, I think that most emerging or rare parasites of humans will fall into this box or sometimes into this box in this set of stages. Okay, any other questions? Any question from the Zoom? Ajahn Somchai, go to another microphone. <laughs> any question from the Zoom or internet meeting? Have any question? Good morning, Professor Bray. Oh, hi. Oh, hi. How are you? How are you? I'm very yes, happy I can hear you. to uh, heard your presentation. A very excellent presentation. Thank you so much. I thought, uh, I would like to ask you only how are you and your wife. <laughs> <laughs> Well, also, David, well. also, David, uh, if no question from the uh, the room, I, I like to ask you, do you believe or not Palagonimus simensis can infect human or not in the next, in next period or something like that? Um, that is a species which possibly in the future could infect humans. I think if enough humans eat enough crabs, that contain Metasicariae of Paragonimus siamensis. I think it is possible that some of those occasionally will develop to maturity in humans. Um, we have the example in India of Paragonimus westermani. People in parts of India eat many freshwater crabs containing Metasicariae of Paragonimus heterotremus and of Paragonimus westermani. Mm. They don't become infected with Paragonimus westermani until now. Recently, there was one example of a human infection <coughs> with Paragonimus westermani in India, but only one infection, only one case. Yeah. I think it can happen for Siamensis. Mm, because Siamensis, the sister species of westermani. <laughs> Correct. OK, thank you very much, Professor David. <laughs> Are there more questions from the floor? I saw that. Dr. Natawood also attended the meeting. Dr. Natawood, do you have any questions? 
as you said, virus mutate, but not uh, parasite is not mutate or slow mutation, right? Is uh, what is the main mutation in the organism itself or mutation in the host? Uh, oh, I think mostly mutation in the parasite or mutation in the virus. Parasites, um, again, we could take the example because Ajahn Opal has been working on it of Haemonchus contortus. Um, that is a species which has enormous genetic diversity within it. So if we look at Haemonchus all over the world, the genetic diversity is very, very considerable. One or two individuals in that population may be capable of infecting humans because of their genetic makeup. Um, others will not. But if the ones that are capable of infecting humans get into a human host and pass eggs out, it could be that those will infect a new human. And now you have a host switch underway. So it's mutations in the parasite or in the virus that I mean. Does that answer your question? You said in the parasite will be take a long time. Could you example for the parasite can take a long time? We have no, we have no really good examples. There are no examples that are documented. So I can't really give you an example uh, because we, we haven't been doing research long enough to be able to come up with an example, I think. If we could go back a thousand years and look at parasites then and now, maybe we could have some clear examples. But I can't give you a good example at the moment. At the moment, it's really theoretical. Okay. And one you said, virus is a can for you uh, vaccine, right? But you mean or parasite is an infected vaccine. Can you explain why you mean or parasite is less effective for vaccine? Yes, the explanation is quite simple. Um, there are a small number of vaccines available for use against parasites but only in animals and they only work a bit. There are some parasite uh, vaccines available for coccidia. Um, there is a vaccine that has been used against tinea in cattle to prevent development of the cysticerci, but no vaccines other than that that have worked against parasites. Um, Ajahn Opal would be able to tell us more because of her background. I'm not up to date. Okay. Yeah. Parasites yeah, are multi yeah, mostly multi-celled animals that have to spend a long time in the host. If they spend a long time in a host, they must have ways of evading the immune system. Therefore, they have ways of making the immune system not see them, or they have ways of suppressing the immune system. There are various different mechanisms that they use. If you vaccinate somebody against a parasite, the parasite will just laugh. It'll say, ha ha, you have antibodies against me anyway, but they don't worry me. Whereas for a virus, the virus, most viruses, not all, most viruses go in quickly, multiply quickly, shed their offspring quickly, then the immune system catches up with them and destroys them, sterilizing immunity. Things like schistosomes, multicelled parasites, live in the blood of humans for many, many years. They can survive the attack of the immune system. Things like trypanosomes survive the attack of the immune system, malaria parasites, all sorts of things. They live for a long time and they evade the immune system, which is why vaccines don't work very well against them. Does that answer your question? Yes, uh, thank you. And one more question. You said uh, compare between Timothore, Setor, and Nematode for more specific, right? And when we compare two protozoa, such as intestinal protozoa, about the group, such as Jaidea or Yeast or Coxidea, intestinal protozoa, how about the specific for more specific? 
Um, I know Hellman's better than I know protozoans. Um, so I usually, I took most of the examples from Hellman's. For protozoans, there is a strong tendency for them also to be host specific. But it differs with different species, different types. I think the same spectrum of host specificity occurs in protozoans as in helminths. Some are very specific, some are not so specific. Um, I prefer not to speculate too much because I really don't have enough information. Sorry, <laughs> that's my answer. Okay. Are there any more questions from the floor or from the audience? Excuse me, I have one question. One question. You mentioned about the dry egg. Um, of course, it, it, um, if I understand, uh, the right understand, it means if the force has the similar dry egg. Tend to um, uh, parasite switching, uh, the force switch. Um, uh, just before you go on, according to my computer, your microphone is switched off. Uh, just check the microphone. Or use a different microphone. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that's better. Um, can you hear me? Oh, professor? Yes. Okay. I have one question. You mentioned in slide number 20 about the diet of food um if i um right understand for the information it mean uh if the host have the similar diet it can to uh parasite switching from the uh one host to the another host right correct yes oh okay and uh, from this slide, it, you mean um, the horse such as the human and cat have a similar diet. It can to switch, uh, the parasite can switch from the horse and to another horse, right? Um, that's, well, this particular chart really is wildlife species. So it's the chance that humans can share helminths parasites with wildlife species. Um, cats, since people live with cats anyway, that's somewhat different. So here you can see high probability that, because humans are green here, this green bar, you can see there's a high probability that if wildlife species have a similar diet to humans, they will share similar parasites. Mm -hmm. And you can also see for the cat, which is, I think, this blue line here. Similarly, if wildlife species have a high similarity in diet with a cat, it's likely that they'll share more parasite species. Um, I would encourage you to get a copy of the paper by Wells et al. I'll send a PDF version of this talk to Ajahn Somchai when we finish and he can send it on to other people who might want to copy. Okay. Thank you. And one question uh, from the OV, uh, Opitokis Bivolini, they found the OV in the duck. In your opinion, do you, do you think this is a horse specific or horse wishing? Ah, now then, in my opinion, there is an excellent research topic for somebody. We know, um, <laughs> Professor Nawa and I, for some years, have been collecting papers about Opistorchis and Opistorchis viverini. What we have found is that the genus Opistorchis has many, many worms in it, different worms. They all look exactly the same. 
but the molecules are different, as we know. Some of those occur in ducks, some occur in people, some occur in catfish. Some fish have things in them that look like Opistorchis viverini, adults. What we need to do is a research project to look in fish, to look in ducks, and to do molecular work to try to work out that problem. I do not know whether Opistorchis viverini in ducks is the same as Opistorchis viverini in humans. The worms look similar, but we don't yet know. That's a research project that I would like to do. Or perhaps you can do it, Jan Mutterman. Uh, Professor, last year you were so successful for further uh, field or further study. This year, could you give uh, your idea or what we can do in the research for Palestine in this field or this area? Could you? Because last year you uh, suggest very important message for us. This year, could you suggest again? Um, I can't remember. What I suggested last year, yes. um, I can't remember, but, but some of the things that are coming out of today's talk that seem to me to be interesting are exactly the question Ajahn Natanan asked, and in fact I discussed it last year. Take a look at catfish, wild catfish from the Mekong, to see if they have adult opistorchis in the bile ducts because something like that has been reported from India and I think from Vietnam, but no one has looked in, in Thailand. Um, take a look in ducks, take a look in herons. Has anybody gone to Lawa Lake and looked in egrets or herons? Do you know what those are? Those are birds that eat fish. Take a look and see whether those contain Opistorchis in the liver and see whether they are morphologically or molecularly the same as Opistorchis viverini. This needs to be discovered. This needs to be found out. And it would be an interesting project. It could be a student project. Um, another, another research program, which I suggested just now, is to try to find what the mechanism is by which Sakeri recognize the right kind of fish. You generally find Opistorchis viverini only in Suprinids. Why not in other kinds of fish? There must be some reason why the Sakeri don't penetrate other kinds. What is it? Now, this is probably pure research rather than applied research, so it may be more difficult for you to justify it or to get funds for it. But I think it's an interesting problem. You could also do the same at the snail stage. Why is it that Myricidia will penetrate just one kind of snail and not another? What is the cue that they use? There certainly are projects there for people to follow in the future. Does that help? Maybe I've sent everybody to sleep. Are you sleeping? <laughs> Thank, thanks for your very important message for us. Are there any more questions? Hello. If no more questions, let me have a big thank to Professor David again. Thank you.